Shall we start the second and last day of these two days meeting, um, the final LAPSI and EVPSI meeting? Uh, so today we are going to talk about licenses and um, independent authorities, um, regulatory bodies. Uh, we are going to have um, several speakers with us. Uh, most of them have already uh, participated to other LAPSI or AVPSI meetings. Some of them are new and we are really thankful that they all accepted our invitation. Um, we are going to start um, with the session on licenses, which is really um, requiring many of the LAPSI efforts in, in these last months because we are, as you know, uh, we are drafting guidelines uh, for, um, uh, for the European Commission about um, out, what we call output licenses. Um, so we're going to have presentations on national, on ad hoc licenses examples and other presentations on uh, Creative Commons, the Creative Commons example, and a final presentation on the li in the licensing section uh, on many of the problems that are existing uh, as to the uh, combination of several licenses on several kind of data. We are going to have a second session on uh, independent authorities and uh, well institutional needs. Uh, in the second session, one speaker is missing, uh, one LAPSI partner is missing, and he is the LAPSI partner who is drafting the, the policy recommendation on uh, regulatory bodies. But unfortunately, unfortunately, he is sick, so he couldn't make it. But uh, the chair of the second session is has invented something. Uh, this night for covering this gap. Um, I don't think I have anything else to say, so I give the floor to Graham Olds, who is chairing the first session. Uh, a very big welcome to everybody, and uh, uh, I'm personally really looking forward to this session. I think we have a, a great set of speakers lined up for you this morning. I'll uh, introduce Ernesto Belisario from the Italian Association for Open Government. Uh, I think he has unusual superpowers. Buongiorno a tutti, io darò questo mio intervento in italiano. Ringrazio gli organizzatori di questo evento che mi hanno voluto qui perché mi consentono di fare una riflessione a voce alta su un tema che mi è molto caro, che è quello delle licenze, eh, in particolar modo dell'esperienza italiana, cui eh, con eh, alcuni, eh, tra questi c'è Federico Morando, abbiamo avuto modo di confrontarci nel corso degli ultimi anni ormai. Chi sono? Sono Ernesto Berisario, sono un avvocato specializzato in diritto amministrativo e scienza dell'amministrazione, questo vi dà il taglio con cui io guardo questo problema. La mia formazione è una formazione di amministrativista puro eh, e quindi eh, soprattutto inizialmente eh, il mio eh, interesse è stato quello di eh, capire le dinamiche eh, con cui le amministrazioni si approcciavano al riutilizzo dell'informazione del settore pubblico, in generale all'open data eh, in particolare. Proverò a parlarvi, questo è il tema che mi è stato assegnato, eh, della IODL o Italian Open Data License, cercando di spiegare cos'è, come è nata, quali sono le tappe della sua evoluzione principali, quali sono le caratteristiche così eh, come eh, è oggi eh, e quali sono gli scenari che si aprono e dopodiché mi auguro che ci sia da parte vostra eh, un, eh, un contributo perché gli scenari, come vedremo, sono contraddittori tra di loro. Cominciamo con un po' di storia. Quando nasce la uh, IODL? Beh, la IODL nasce in beta nell'ottobre del 2010. Eh, in realtà nasce eh, più come licenza manifesto. Perché? Eh, nell'ottobre del 2010 il governo italiano, in particolar modo il ministro per la pubblica amministrazione e l'innovazione, lancia un progetto eh, che si chiama MIAPA. 
eh, questo progetto prevede tra le diverse attività collaterali la messa a disposizione in formato aperto eh, del dataset relativo apparentemente banale eh, ma fino ad allora assolutamente eh, impensabile anche per l'Italia del dataset relativo agli indirizzi degli uffici pubblici. Eh, questa operazione eh, era strumentale alla realizzazione di un'applicazione che consentisse di eh, geolocalizzare gli uffici su un'applicazione eh, e poi consentisse di trovare l'ufficio più vicino eh, a me e eh, di eh, esprimere addirittura una valutazione eh, sull'ufficio se mi ero trovato bene o male con le cosiddette emoticons o le cosiddette eh, faccine. Eh, quando eh, a valle di questo progetto eh, il governo eh, si eh, chiede con quale licenza pubblicare eh, questi dati, eh, l'idea eh, è quella di elaborare eh, con tutta una serie di limiti che tra un po' vedremo, eh, una licenza eh, che avesse un nome abbastanza programmatico e cioè l'idea era quella di cominciare già eh, ad eh, affermare un principio di eh, riutilizzo eh, era quello di parliamo dell'Italia dell dell'ottobre del 2010 in cui l'Opendetta era conosciuta soltanto da queste parti perché la faceva soltanto eh, Regione Piemonte sostanzialmente eh, in cui timidamente il governo eh, affermava un'adesione eh, a quei criteri tuttavia c'erano una serie di limiti il primo limite eh, era legato eh, al fatto che eh, vi era, nonostante ci fosse un dataset apparentemente poco rilevante, eh, c'era l'inibizione, il divieto di riutilizzo per finalità commerciali, eh, che ovviamente ha fatto ampiamente discutere la comunità eh, sul fatto di come possiamo parlare di open data se eh, in realtà abbiamo questo tipo di restrizione perché non è compatibile con l'open definition, ovviamente giustamente, dopodiché vi erano tutta una serie di imprecisioni terminologiche, eh, però l'atteggiamento governativo nei confronti di queste eccezioni qual è stato? È stato quello di, eh, questa era la eh, IODL iniziale, però era, eh, ripeto, una IODL beta. Ovviamente il governo quando, si è, quando ha realizzato questo tipo di, lo staff di mia PR ha realizzato questo tipo di licenza, chi si è ispirato? Beh, ovviamente si è ispirato eh, a Creative Commons da un lato e dall'altro si è ispirato eh, alla licenza che da poco era stata pubblicata la Open Gov License eh, del, del, del governo inglese. Che cosa succede, vi dicevo? Mm, ci sono delle critiche. Mm, di fronte a queste critiche, mm, in modo assolutamente commendevole, eh, il governo italiano non si chiude a riccio, ma cosa fa? Costituisce presso Forme SPA un gruppo di lavoro, cioè un gruppo di esperti in cui sono rappresentati eh, giuristi eh, di differenti ambiti, eh, cito tra eh, coloro che sono presenti eh, Federico Morando, immagino che ci sia eh, Marco Ciurcina eh, che anche ha contribuito a questo lavoro in un gruppo ristretto eh, e questo gruppo ristretto comincia a fare un lavoro abbastanza massiccio di revisione del testo, di quello che era il dozzinale testo iniziale della licenza ehm, e ehm, realizza questo tipo di, di licenza. Eh, un, una licenza da cui scompare il divieto di eh, riutilizzo per finalità commerciali eh, ma rimane una clausola tipo share like cioè che obbliga eh, il riutilizzatore, il soggetto che riutilizza a mantenere i lavori derivati sotto la stessa licenza IOTL o una delle licenze eh, compatibili che venivano individuate eh, c'era in particolar modo DBL eh, e eh, Creative Commons Attribution Share Like 3.0 e questa è la licenza eh, come dire, con la quale eh, si è anche iniziato l'esperienza del portare dati aperti. Una cosa però eh, voglio chiarire per chi non conosce l'esperienza IODL, la DL non è le, la licenza obbligatoria, cioè l'opzione che è stata fatta ehm, e io mi auguro che venga mantenuta qui svelo eh, come la penso, mh, è che sia una delle licenze tra cui le amministrazioni possono scegliere, ma non sia la licenza, anche perché non credo molto nelle imposizioni dall'alto. Dopo la pubblicazione nell'aprile del 2011 di questa IODL 1.0, quindi una IODL che esce dalla beta e arriva nella eh, versione 1.0, viene costituita questa eh, comunità su mh, 
eh, Innovatori PA. Cos'è Innovatori PA.it? Eh, è una specie di eh, social network della pubblica amministrazione, è una rete in cui ci sono eh, civil servants, eh, esperti, docenti eh, che discutono dei diversi temi legati all'innovazione del settore pubblico. La scelta di Forma SPA è stata quella di aprire la licenza anche nel senso di tenere un gruppo di discussione aperto eh, in cui chiunque può eh, segnalare una serie di punti, eh, di modifiche eh, auspicabili eh, che vengono discusse dal resto della comunità, non è molto partecipata, c'è qualche decina di membri, però le discussioni sono, eh, sono utili eh, e dopo una discussione su questa comunità si è arrivati alla seconda revisione della IODL, la revisione dopo la consultazione pubblica che ha visto la nascita della cosiddetta versione 2.0 della IODL che come dire, supera la clausola tipo share life, cioè di condivisione con la stessa licenza, la messa in situazione con la stessa licenza o con licenza compatibile e l'unico obbligo diventa quello della citazione della fonte, questa è la eh, IODL 2.0 così come, eh, come la conosciamo. Eh, a distanza di eh, qualche mese l'uso della eh, IODL eh, è come dire, eh, abbastanza variegato, abbiamo sul portale datiapertidati.gov.it ci sono all'incirca 300 dataset che sono rilasciati eh, con questa licenza e ne è una delle licenze più utilizzate eh, insieme a Credit Commons by, ehm, lo utilizzano PIA centrali come il Ministero della Salute, il Ministero dell'Economia, il Ministero dello Sviluppo Economico e enti come l'Inps, eh, ci sono anche regioni eh, e amministrazioni eh, comunali che eh, come dire, anche relativamente importanti tra quelle che hanno iniziato questa esperienza che, ehm, che la stanno utilizzando. Eh, quali sono le caratteristiche principali? Beh, ehm, io non sottovaluterei, trattandosi di licenza destinata prevalentemente ad un ambito pubblica amministrazione, la valenza programmatica del preambolo, nel senso che ehm, potrà sembrare strano perché parlo di un consesso di persone tutte ampiamente eh, alfabetizzate su questi temi eh, e ben più erudite di me, eh, però eh, quando bisogna parlare con le pubbliche amministrazioni italiane, noi stiamo parlando di eh, un portale di dati aperti, poi lo, lo vedo magari faremo dei confronti con altri portali eh, nazionali, ma l'Italia ha, credo adesso, eh, all'incirca 2000 dati liberati, quindi stiamo parlando di eh, un numero ancora poco rilevante per quello che è il mio avviso, quindi la valenza programmatica di questo preambolo eh, è, è assolutamente importante, quindi eh, vuole tranquillizzare le pubbliche amministrazioni sul fatto che il riutilizzo dei loro dati sia un valore da perseguire e possa essere fatto in modo eh, assolutamente, eh, assolutamente corretto, ecco perché ci sono una serie di rassicurazioni, no? eh, i diritti non implicano trasferimento della titolarità della banca dati, dati e informazioni pubbliche eh, e via discorrendo. Le libertà concesse, così come eh, venute fuori dalla discussione pubblica sono queste, eh, riprodurre, distribuire al pubblico, concedere in locazione, presentare e dimostrare in pubblico, comunicare al pubblico, mettere a disposizione del pubblico, eh, trasmettere e ritrasmettere in qualunque modo, eseguire, recitare, rappresentare, includere in opere collettive o composte, pubblicare, estrarre, replicare le informazioni, è una ehm, definizione che ha l'ampia influenza della legge italiana sul diritto d'autore 633 del 1941, eh, la seconda è quella di creare un lavoro derivato, di esercitare sul lavoro derivato i diritti di quel punto precedente, per esempio attraverso la combinazione eh, con altre informazioni e qui il riferimento eh, al mesh up diventa eh, assolutamente eh, esplicito. Quali sono i punti di forza della IODL? Mm. I punti di forza sono che a distanza di due anni è una licenza che viene ormai conosciuta dalle amministrazioni e non solo perché cominciano ad esserci anche alcuni utilizzi fuori dall'ambito amministrativo, però mi rendo conto che questi sono marginali. E poi si tratta di una... L'altro punto di forza è che si tratta di una licenza aperta, c'è cioè una discussione pubblica eh, e io la vedo eh, come una grandissima risorsa perché eh, è una piccola arma che può farla eh, evolvere.
quali sono i punti di debolezza invece quelli che io vedo le criticità della IODL eh, la prima, eh, IODL eh, è una licenza nazionale come tutte le licenze nazionali ha un gap non indifferente a quello cioè di essere conosciuta eh, in questo paese ma di non essere eh, adeguatamente conosciuta all'estero eh, tenuto conto che tra l'altro non esiste eh, una eh, traduzione ufficiale della licenza eh, come dire, per quanto eh, Google Translate sia come eh, dimostrato da Federico in più di qualche contesto abbondantemente eh, efficace per avere eh, una traduzione eh, soddisfacente della licenza um, e poi um, vi confesso che da non esponente della pubblica amministrazione la parte relativa alle garanzie la vedo ancora, c'è cioè un esonero di responsabilità ancora troppo ampio in cui le amministrazioni che pubblicano i dati con questo tipo di, questo tipo di licenza forniscono ancora poche garanzie, c'è cioè un esonero di responsabilità troppo ampio che in parte riflette l'incertezza delle amministrazioni sul livello di affidabilità dei propri dati ma è una condizione che è accettabile in questo momento ma che io credo debba essere superata eh, e questo significa naturalmente che per essere superata le amministrazioni devono investire eh, nella, eh, nella qualità dei propri dati. Quali sono i due scenari che si aprono a questo punto e che lascio aperti perché sono in chiusura? Eh, il primo scenario è un superamento della IODL, perché? Perché magari riusciamo nell'ambito dei decreti digitali a fare a meno di una licenza, cioè eh, riusciamo a stabilire, vedo anche Simone Librandi che aveva eh, interpretato eh, la legge già vigente sul diritto d'autore in modo tale da rendere inutile eh, una licenza, eh, beh, i decreti digitali potrebbero eh, introdurre un regime giuridico dei dati tale per cui non c'è più bisogno, oppure superamento della IODL perché andiamo verso la petizione che immagino molti di voi conosceranno della licenza paneuropea, no? cioè una licenza unica eh, in cui eh, ovviamente facciamo scomparire anche la IODL. Questo è uno scenario, l'altro scenario leggo alcune proposte eh, per l'agenda digitale in discussione in Parlamento, magari presentate da forze politiche, eh, che invece tendono a eh, imporre eh, questa licenza come licenza di default per quelli che sono i dati della pubblica amministrazione. Confesso che eh, questa seconda, pur avendoci lavorato, questa seconda, eh, questo secondo scenario non mi convince per i motivi che se volete eh, affronteremo, eh, affronteremo più tardi. Io per il momento vi ringrazio per l'attenzione eh, e resto a disposizione per domande nello spazio a luogo dedicato oppure eh, a questi recapiti a cui mi trovate online. Grazie. Which I picked up on from Ernesto's uh, presentation there was how important this Italian open data license was. Um, you talked us through your approach and uh, data.gov.it uh, and I was very interested that you drew inspiration from Creative Commons. Uh, and one question I had in my mind was why were you not able to adopt directly the Creative Commons? And what were the specific for the, uh, uh, the Italian Open Data License? Non siamo riusciti ad adottare direttamente Creative Commons perché eh, la situazione della pubblica amministrazione due anni fa, quando è nata IODL italiana, era probabilmente eh, di una sfiducia totale. Inserire per un dataset che reca soltanto gli indirizzi delle scuole o degli uffici pubblici eh, il divieto di riutilizzo per finalità commerciale è figlio è evidente di una diffidenza nei confronti del riutilizzo, quindi eh, parlare di Creative Commons eh, nel 2010 era oggettivamente azzardato, probabilmente non siamo stati bravi noi della comunità eh, ad, arrivare, eh, ad arrivare in modo capillare, ma è difficile oggi, figuriamoci due anni fa, io sono molto soddisfatto che eh, questo eh, mezzo della DODL sia servito eh, a dare tranquillità ad alcune amministrazioni, ripeto penso a amministrazioni con come eh, il Ministero del Tesoro, che c'è la Gioneria Generale dello Stato che ci ha rilasciato dei dati della spesa pubblica, quindi cominciamo eh, ad arrivare all'obiettivo di far rilasciare delle informazioni rilevanti per i cittadini eh, in formato aperto. Poi sulle licenze possiamo continuare a lavorarci, intanto rompiamo una pledge. Sorry, have one more question from the floor. Excuse me. Actually, it is to, to a certain extent it's a reply to your question. Um, We should always remember that Creative Commons uh, 
uh, does have a weakness in connection with databases. And I'm sure that Timothy is going to talk about this. At the moment in which uh, this idea came up, what was available at the Italian level was a database. So it would have been a bit uh, paradoxical that uh, Creative Commons was adopted as there was no work to begin with and a database. So this may be an explanation. Okay, Mark, thank you very much for that clarification. And uh, I'm looking forward to Timothy's presentation later on and perhaps he can pick up on that point. So I thank you very much, Ernesto, and I suggest we move on now to uh, John Williams from the uh, National Archives in the UK. So, John, if you'd like to uh, step up and uh, I'll uh, read a little bit of your bio here. But uh, John's responsibility within the National Archives for the United Kingdom is that he's a member of a team that deals with complaints for the reuse of public sector information under the PSI regulations. And uh, this is of particular interest to me because uh, I'm also working on certain aspects of uh, rights management within the UK location framework. So I'm very pleased that uh, John will be with us. Thank you very much, Graham. And um, if I could start by saying thank you very much to Marco and Christiana and colleagues for arranging such a, an intellectually stimulating uh, set of meetings. Um, we've certainly, at the National Archives in the UK, found the discussions very um, interesting and relevant to our work. So, so thank you to, to Marco and Christiana and colleagues for, for arranging these meetings. Um, I've slightly altered the title of my presentation um, and called it Standardisation and Licensing um, because I do think that in the United Kingdom we are sort of trying to move towards a reasonably standardised approach um, to licensing. Um, just if I could start by uh, introducing what the sort of role of the National Archives is. Um, we have a number of different functions. Um, one of these is, is policy lead on the reuse of public sector information regulations um, and policy lead on the negotiations that are currently taking place on the directive proposal, which is obviously um, occupying a lot of people's thoughts at the moment, um, something that we're certainly uh, spending a lot of time on, analysing the various um, proposals that are coming out of, um, of the directive. Uh, we're also responsible for Crown copyright information, um, which um, is quite crucial in the context of the UK, because it's essentially the key to public sector information. Virtually all the sort of central government information is, is Crown copyright. Um, as part of that, as, as Paul Torrens alluded to yesterday, um, there's been a kind of evolution in Crown copyright, and we hope we hope that we're moving um, away from um, control in order to uh, realise commercial revenue towards a more enabling approach. And um, part of that enabling approach is um, the development of the UK government licensing framework and specifically the open government license, which I'll be talking to you about in more detail later. Um, just a brief, uh, brief definition, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with, um, and we've probably spent some hours and possibly days debating exactly what the significance of this, this definition is, but there's a technical definition of, of reuse um, as defined in, in the regulations. Um, and then there's a more, uh, more practical definition, which, which is publishing in any medium, adapting, copying. Um, essentially, doing something with the original data, uh, doing something um, to add to that data and, and, and make greater use of it in, in some form or other. So, how do we actually, um, as, the, as the National Archives, how do we actually oversee reuse? And how do we sort of encourage and, and enable reuse? Um, 
one of these, one of the ways we do that is through, through the uh, UK government licensing framework, of which the open government license is a key part. Um, and generally speaking, our approach is that the open government license is the default, so that is the starting point. Um, there are some organisations we delegate authority for licensing to, uh, for example, um, the uh, mapping and meteorological agencies in the UK. So, generally speaking, um, for most government departments, they now use the open government licence, very simple, straightforward means of licensing. But there are uh, one or two uh, bodies that we delegate authority to who have more complex, in, complex licensing requirements. Um, having said that, we still require them to operate to standard set of um, fair trading principles, which we also oversee. And the last means by which we oversee reuse is to um, provide sort of standard text for websites and publications. So, um, what is the UK government licensing framework? Well, it's, it's a framework which um, gives a policy and legal overview for licensing. So, the framework as a, as a whole is a sort of guidance document um, that, that public bodies can consult when, when deciding you know, what they need to do, what uh, approaches they need to follow. It sets out best practice and standardises the licensing principles and um, it recommends the open license as the default license. Um, very much part of the government's drive to open up access, um, which is about promoting transparency sort of for public benefit, um, but also um, building on the idea of wider economic benefit from, from, what, from, from wider reuse. So when we develop the UK government licensing framework, um, it's probably important to think, sort of look back and, and have a bit of history. Before we came up with this framework, we would be centrally licensing um, information in a, in, a, in a more, in a fairly, uh, in what could be seen as a fairly bureaucratic fashion because you had to register with us and we then had to process a license and it was a fairly lengthy process. So what we wanted to do is come up with something really simple and non-transactional. Um, so there was a, a, require, a need to streamline our own licensing process, but there was also a, um, some inspiration drawn from the open data movement and from bodies like Creative Commons who are uh, also speaking at this conference. Um, we did put a lot of work to, to come up with the license and we, we believe it's a very straightforward, um, simple one-page license still legally sound but very easy to use. Um, so the, the timeline for this was that um, we, we launched the Open Government Licence back in September 2010 and received the endorsement from our, um, the UK Local Government Association. Following January, um, a Gordon survey, the mapping agency, um, it releases some small and mid-scale data sets for free and it adopted the Open Government Licence for the licensing of these data sets. There was also guidance issued by Locate UK Location and um, then, up in, then in August of last year we, we released a second iteration of the UK Government Licensing Framework. So the centrepiece of the UK GLF is, is the Open Government Licence. Um, we believe it provides certainty to users in plain language. Uh, covers a lot of material, as I was saying, pretty much all the central government information is now released under the Open Government Licence. And this is the uh, licence which supports data.gov.uk. Um, it's a very enabling licence because you can use the data for, for any purpose, whether commercial or non-commercial. Non and um, it's non-transactional. We consider it to be interoperable with other licenses uh, like uh, Creative Commons. Uh, it's also machine readable and it's um, lastly and most importantly it's free. There's no charge to, to, to use it and, and uh, the data that is released under it is free. So some of the elements of the OGL 
um, information, um, where the relevant uh, rights owner or information provider has um, the authorities for misuse. use. Um, so, provided the information provider has, has that authority, then they can use this license. It's not just about Crown copyright, it's about all data in the UK and all information in the UK. The data should be non-personal, um, subject to data, copyright and database right. Um, so it does, cover, it does cover database right, and this is a point that was referred to earlier, that when create, at the point we were developing this, the equivalent Creative Commons license didn't um, cover database right. Um, and it's allowing uh, previously unpublished data sets to be released by the public sector. It also covers source code and uh, software, um, albeit uh, we don't insist on bodies using this license. They could also use um, a standard, they could also refer to the suite of licenses that is recommended by the uh, Open Source Initiative. So we had quite a positive, um, quite a positive reaction to the Open Government license. Um, Possibly not quite as ecstatic as the picture in, that goes along with these slides, but nevertheless, um, we did get a lot of praise from, from users. Um, government departments were very pleased with it. Um, there was an initial you know, reluctance and suspicion about from central government departments saying, well, is this actually, you know, this, what, are we covered if we release data under this, this license? Um, you, know, do, you know, so on and so forth. But, but, but now, um, you know, government departments are very happy, happy to um, release data under the OGL. Um, other countries have um, ad ad adopted it or adapted it. Um, Canada, South Korea, France, um, and uh, our colleagues in Italy um, have evidently drawn some inspiration from the o OGL. Um, it's actually been taken up by a lot in local government, so that's not something where we don't have the authority to require local government to use it, but the take up in local authorities has actually been very impressive. Um, I think it's because if you use this license, there's, a very, there's no administrative overhead. You don't have to set up a licensing department. You can just get on with releasing data and know that you've got a coherent license sitting behind it. Um, a UK parliament has issued its own version uh, called the Open Parliament Licence, so that's another thing which is all based on, on the OGL. And then some quite influential stakeholders like Sir, Sir Tim Berners-Lee and Tom Steinberg from the United Kingdom Transparency Board um, welcomed its introduction. So we, we in creating the licence, we, we asked for lots of views from different stakeholders, which, which I've listed there. Um, one, of those, one of those groups we, we spoke to was Creative Commons, and I'll be interested to hear uh, my colleague from Creative Commons uh, talking directly after me. We came up with a second iteration of the UK GLF um, to cater for Inspire requirements with some public bodies wanted to be able to license on a non commercial basis. So we've introduced a non commercial government license. This isn't an open license, but it's an option available. Um, it's still very much something that would be used in exceptional circumstances. And um, we also issued some more guidance on policy on licensing software and um, generally um, updated out for guidance to um, make sure that the Inspire requirements were taken into account. Therefore, there was no need to create a whole new suite of licenses for Inspire, but we already have something that deals with all, all those requirements. Um, just, so just in conclusion, um, recent developments and, and looking ahead, the um, OGL um, still um, an increasing number of organisations are, are taking uh, the OGL. Uh, now includes the uh, mapping and uh, meteorological and land registration agencies. All of those bodies now release some of their data sets for free and use, and all of them do so under OGL terms. Um, obviously, there's a proposal from the European Commission to amend the PSI directive. Um, in the licensing context, there's a 
thought of saying there should be a uh, commission guidance on standard licensing, um, something that we um, are certainly uh, very happy with. We don't see any uh, necessarily um, see the need to write that into the directive, but nor on the other hand do we object to it because we think that we have a, a fairly coherent package of guidance for standard licensing in the UK. Um, what's um, occupied our minds on the directive are other issues like marginal costs and the extension to cultural bodies. So um, licenses and licensing is important, um, but obviously there are other, other um, very key aspects of the new directive proposal. Um, finally, uh, the UK GLF is a living document that we'll, uh, we'll periodically review, so uh, we don't see it set in stone, we see it as something that we will uh, revisit from, from time to time. So thank you very much. And thank you very much, Don. I think that was a, a very useful overview of what's happening in the UK. Uh, and I've happened to be observing what's been going on in the UK, and I think there's a, a lot of groundbreaking work that you are doing. So I'd like to thank you. Uh, congratulations for that. So, uh, uh, Any further thoughts from the audience before we move on to our next presenter? Thanks, sir. I will just uh, want to make a comment. Uh, indeed, uh, the UK uh, open government license is uh, serve as an inspiration for uh, others elsewhere to uh, pick up uh, this good, uh, good practice. Uh, and uh, the Commission itself, uh, because you know, uh, I, I mentioned yesterday, uh, the Commission uh, a new a reuse decision is uh, in force since December last year. Uh, uh, it's helpful to uh, face this uh, uh, problem and to develop uh, a kind of uh, license framework for its own uh, portal, which will be uh, launched uh, next September. And uh, of course, uh, the UK example was uh, one of our sources of inspiration. Uh, we very much appreciate the simplicity uh, of this uh, initiative. Uh, as, as well as the Creative Commons, of course. We also uh, draw some inspiration uh, from there. But uh, we finally decided, uh, because you know this, one of the features of this new uh, reuse decision is that uh, uh, there is no need for uh, requesting uh, reuse. Uh, um, uh, reuse can be done without application and uh, in, on a free, uh, on a free uh, fashion. So we um, decided to simplify even more uh, this UK uh, uh, license and have uh, just a, a, a very simple copyright notice uh, pointing out that reuse is allowed according to the decision, uh, subject to acknowledgement of the source. And you will see in the Europa site, uh, uh, I hope already today, uh, the, the new uh, copyright notice, which is a, 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 an oversimplified version, let's say, of the UK. Uh, simple ain't easy. It takes. Thank you so much, Timothy, for uh, joining us today and travelling all that distance. Uh, I think the work you're doing is very core cool for where we take um, licensing on the web, and the, the work that you've done as uh, Open Data Coordinator, working as a policy fellow. Uh, and particularly working on the program for public access to information for the American Library Association uh, and the information technology policy in Washington. I think is very pertinent to what we're doing. And uh, thank you once again for traveling that long distance to be with us here in uh, Torino. Thank you very much and thank you for moderating. Uh, like I said, I'm Tim Walmer from Creative Commons. Uh, and I just want to echo the other speakers in extending thanks to Marco and Christiana and everyone from LabC for conducting this extremely important work and uh, thank you for inviting me to this conference. So I thought we would talk a little bit about the Creative Commons 4.0 upgrade and how it might affect public sector information. Uh, just to let you know, uh, this is going to be a snapshot in time because uh, the 4.0 license is not done yet. Um, so please take that into consideration as we go forward today. 
So just a little bit of background, Creative Commons tools are obviously in use for public sector information uh, around the world, um, from Australia, New Zealand, uh, in Europe, over 30 uh, national governments. Um, and beyond the licenses, uh, some jurisdictions are also using our public domain tools. Uh, Piemonte Regional Government and the Netherlands. Um, and also, you know, insofar as the outdated directive uh, is including cultural institutions, um, we think this is uh, very progressive. And it's a good sign because many cultural institutes are already using Creative Commons licenses and public domain tools, for example, Europeana, uh, using CC0 for their metadata, uh, as well as a British library. So uh, CC 3.0 is the operable license right now, and we've heard from some uh, PSI bodies that they're unable to use it for their needs. And uh, the obvious reference here is uh, in, in reference to sui generis database rights and how the Creative Commons license handles those, uh, but also for other reasons. Uh, and an unintended consequence of this is that we've experienced quite significant license proliferation. Um, licenses such as the Open Data Commons license, which includes the ODBL, uh, licenses um, like the OGL, and also other open government licenses around the world. So the question is, what can Creative Commons 4.0 do to help address some of these problems? So like I mentioned, we're in our license versioning process right now, and we've done this three times since uh, the inception of Creative Commons. Uh, and we hope to have 4.0 license done by the end of this year. So here's a little bit of the timeline. Um, I won't go over all of it, but the uh, kickoff for 4.0 happened in Warsaw last September, where we gathered all our Creative Commons affiliates from around the world and uh, started the uh, versioning process. As usual, the process has been uh, done in public, on uh, public wikis and mailing lists, and we are as transparent as possible and try to include as many voices as possible. Uh, we're at the point now where we're working on draft two, uh, and that should be released within the next couple of weeks to the public, and we look to um, get more feedback on it. And then, as I mentioned, we're looking to publish the final by December of this year. Uh, just some overarching goals of 4.0. Um, obviously, we want to make the license uh, as international, as globally applicable as possible. Uh, we want to increase the ease of adoption um, and the uh, enforceability of the license around the world. Uh, interoperability is a huge concern. Uh, Federico will talk a little bit more about that. Interoperability both with other licenses and to decrease, decrease this license proliferation that we're seeing. Uh, we want the licenses to be durable. We hope 4.0 to be a long lasting, perhaps 10 plus years. Uh, we want the 4.0 license to help address uh, important sectors. So this is obvious for data and public sector information, for science communities, and for open educational resources. And then finally, we want the license to uh, support our existing users uh, and not break expectations. So let's jump into it. Uh, what are some of the things that uh, 4.0 can do for PSI? Uh, we'll look at three categories. What's staying the same? What might be changing? And what are some remaining questions? Uh, a key point that's uh, something that's going to be staying the same is the general operation of the license. So Creative Commons licenses work only where the rights holder has exclusive rights. And this means that the permissions and restrictions um, are not triggered uh, for uses covered under exceptions and limitations to copyright and they're also not triggered for content or pieces of content that's in the public domain, obviously. Uh, another uh, provision that it's going to be staying the same is the no endorsement clause, uh, very crucial for PSI bodies um, and also important for licensees to know about. Um, we're going to be featuring it slightly more prominently in the 4.0 uh, license. Uh, next up, uh, moral rights. Uh, the language might be slightly different in 4.0, uh, but the sentiment is going to be the same. Uh, and 
that is that memorial rights will be uh, unaffected by the Creative Commons license, uh, except where uh, it's required for the licensee to be able to exercise his or her rights under the license. Uh, another thing staying the same uh, in, uh, from the 3.0 version is the marking of changes to adaptations. Uh, another important feature for PSI publishers, uh, and it ensures that licensees note uh, when modification is taking place and really helps promote the integrity of the original content. Uh, TPM, technical protection measures, uh, this will be staying the same as well, we think. Um, it says that licensees can't add digital rights management to works. A uh, non-commercial clause might be less applicable to uh, PSI bodies. Uh, maybe you can tell me. Um, it's always a big contentious issue within the Creative Commons community. And we kind of realize from talking to people and hearing feedback that any change will create even more interpretation problems. And for better or worse, people are using uh, Creative Commons licenses that have the NC condition. Um, and actually building businesses out of it as well. So, planning on keeping that the same. So what are the things that are going to be changing? Um, an obvious one that has been referenced is the handling of sui generis database rights. And um, this is obviously very important for open data and PSI. The 3.0 version of the license doesn't have any mention of uh, sui generis database rights. But the result is, is the same, and that is this. On Creative Commons license databases, the compliance with the license conditions uh, are not required where only sui generis database rights are implicated, uh, but not copyright. So we've heard that this is a big problem for potential European adoptions uh, who prefer a more inclusive solution. So the plan for 4.0 is to uh, say that the license grants copyright and copyright-like rights, which would include sui generis database rights. Uh, another piece that's not actually changing, but we want to provide more clarity to the licensees uh, with the goal of only including the necessary components as a condition of the license and note the rest somewhere else. Uh, either in a framework or here, we're putting it uh, in a preamble. So I'll just read a little bit of it. It says, you are responsible for complying with other laws that may apply to use of the work. And such laws may include laws governing patents, privacy, publicity rights, data protection laws, uh, laws protecting against fraud, misrepresentation, etc." But all these are outside of the scope of the CC license. So uh, another thing that's going to be changing potentially with 4.0 is the requirements around attribution. So 3.0 license has a fairly inclusive list of what's required uh, to uh, attribute the licensor. And uh, one question you might ask, well, is it onerous? I mean, you can look at the list of this. Um, but we know that PSI bodies typically want to receive credit. So it's an ongoing tension between the licensor and the licensee. Uh, we want to be able to allow the licensor to request credit in a way that meets their needs, but at the same time not make it completely burdensome on the user to do so. So we thought, you know, can this be simplified? Can we strip it down uh, to simply noting the author, a URI to the work, and the URI to the license? And while this framework might be good for uh, some users, it's probably not adequate for most PSI bodies. Um, a lot of public sector information publishers need to attach notices, uh, disclaimers, um, other warranty statements. So we're trying to build a little bit of flexibility back into um, the attribution mechanism. Uh, one way is by potentially providing a URI shortcut. 
um, within the URI to the work. Um, another way is to extend the reasonableness language to all the attribution components. What else is changing? Uh, we've been in consultation with several intergovernmental organizations, including UNESCO, WIPO, the OECD. Uh, they had a need for a, a clause around uh, retaining privileges and immunities. Um, does this matter to PSI bodies? Slightly unclear, uh, but we're planning on potentially adding this to 4.0. Finally, let's go into some of the remaining questions. Uh, one is around uh, what constitutes the trigger of the share alike clause. So uh, three, in, in version 3.0 of the license, um, a work that is under a share alike license can be added to a collection, but this does not mean that the entire collection needs to be licensed under share alike, just the individual piece. With 4.0, uh, should it be flipped? Uh, when I add a share alike uh, work to a collection, should the copyright in the collection then become share alike? Obviously, without infecting the other works. Uh, and we're wondering if this is a, a closer approximation of how the GPL does it. Another big thing is uh, attribution with regard to text and data mining. And uh, you know, big data is taking off, this is becoming an increasing issue, uh, but it's also a somewhat ambiguous legal issue. Um, uh, one of the fundamental questions we have to ask is, uh, is copyright implicated in the first place? Uh, if not, fantastic. Uh, but if yes, um, we'll need to provide an exception to copyright or um, a license. If we provide a license, what is the reasonable attribution? Uh, one of the goals is to uh, reduce attribution stacking. So this is an ongoing question that we have. Um, the next uh, question we have is around, should licensors be allowed to add terms to the license um, and have those terms be enforceable? Uh, right now, the Creative Commons license has uh, a note about you know, general limit on liability, but some users have told us that this isn't good enough, um, especially in regard to things like consumer protection laws. So the question is, can licensees require specific sorts of disclaimers and require that they be reproduced alongside the works. Uh, a second case is going back to the intergovernmental organizations who told us that they would like to add an alternative dispute resolution mechanism uh, to the license. Uh, seems somewhat risky in terms of creating custom CC licenses uh, and maybe a slippery slope, so we need to consider this carefully. Uh, two more pieces. Uh, a simple one is uh, curing breach of license. Um, some licensees are violating the license unintentionally. And while licenses like the GPL uh, allow the licensees to get back in compliance and then they get the rights back under the license, the CC license doesn't provide this. The license terminates immediately and then the rights holder has to renegotiate rights with the licensor. Uh, this seems like a reasonable fix and really supports the normative expectations of users. And then finally, uh, our porting discussion. It's a big policy decision for Creative Commons. The question is, should the licenses be ported to individual jurisdictions? Uh, we have 70 jurisdiction ports right now. Uh, and porting is both good and bad. Uh, it's sometimes difficult, sometimes takes a long time, it can be expensive. And the question is, is porting needed? You know, court challenges have typically relied upon the international license, that is the unported license, and not the jurisdiction specific license, so this is interesting. Um, also other open licenses like the GPL uh, aren't ported to individual jurisdictions. Uh, some of our FCC affiliates have told us that you know, they want to retain this because they spent a long time developing relationships with governments and they're able to work with governments to offer, uh, say, you know, Italy-specific CC license. So it needs to be taken into consideration the uh, kind of social and community outreach benefits um, of porting. So that's all I have right now and I'm happy to take any questions or um, any comments.
No, thank you very much, Timothy. I think it was very useful for us to see the uh, overview of what you're doing with Creative Commons and the work you're doing that for 4.0. Um, I'm very pleased to see this expanding into the data, PSI, science and education sectors. I think that's a, there's a massive latent need there uh, and you know, really valuable direction that you, we're getting from you. So thank you for that. I also love the fact that you're introducing uh, more support for the technical protection measures. I think more and more we need to start to automate aspects of licensing. Uh, and uh, I love this idea of um, the licensor um, specifying how they want to be attributed, so a URI or, or whatever mechanism. So I think all of those things really add to, to what you're doing. So uh, are there any questions from the floor? Hi, uh, Adam Porchard, Masaryk University, uh, Czech Republic. Just a very quick question. Do you have some statistics of uh, how the CC is used uh, for public sector information? That's one question. And when it comes to porting, uh, of course one thing is porting into uh, the particular legal environment, and second is having it ported in the way that courts really accept it. So if you have any statistics of when the, P uh, when the CC has been used for PSI and licensing, and it has gone successfully through some court process in some kind of discipline. Sure. Um, we've been kind of informally tracking, so that with regard to the first question, we've been informally tracking, uh, like I said, there was over 30 governments that utilized the CC licenses. Now, we haven't broken it down in terms of, well, how many data sets or how many documents is X government using. We, I suppose we could, but there's no real good way to do that easily right now. Um, but uh, so we're tracking it somewhat informally. And with regard to the question about, uh, the question was, uh, how often do courts use the unported versus the deported? Uh, we track that on our wiki as well, uh, but I mean there's not that many cases actually where Creative Commons has been litigated. Um, I don't know offhand what the exact proportion is, but I do know the, the overwhelming uh, number has relied upon the unported. Um, I think there's maybe, what, six or seven cases, and I think five or six of them relied upon the unported version. Okay, thank you, Timothy, and uh, I suggest we, we move on to our next speaker, Federico. And Federico's background as uh, an economist, and uh, I think where he's working is one of the most challenging areas to try and combine law, economics, and technology. It seems you have to have superpowers in all three fields. So uh, we look forward to seeing that, and uh, uh, I'm very much looking forward to your presentation, so thank you very much, Federico. Uh, so thank you for your introduction, uh, and thanks to the organizer for inviting me. I was very cheap since uh, I live here in Turin. Uh, I will try to uh, uh, give a kind of overview of uh, this uh, interoperability, license interoperability issue. Uh, we are focusing in this session on licenses. I'm focusing on a specific aspect of licenses, but as an open data activist, uh, uh, I think this is really a detail. So as, as, as long as you make your data available online in machine-readable format and with any kind of license allowing for general uh, reuse, in particular also for commercial uh, reuse, I'm absolutely glad as an open data activist. So uh, that said, uh, you can always do better and uh, my presentation focuses on uh, my view about the possibility of doing better in terms of uh, interoperability between licenses. And what I mean by legal interoperability is the possibility of legally mixing data coming from different sources, government data, user-generated content, corporate data. And uh, uh, of course, this also uh, includes the possibility of using this data within a, a broad range of project businesses and uh, community models. So uh, this is a small agenda of my uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to start uh, uh, 
explaining why we care about uh, license uh, uh, interoperability, uh, discussing also if we need licenses at all. Uh, as uh, Mr. Perrault said, this is uh, a hot topic now. Uh, I think it's, it's not a completely solved issue question. Um, then uh, uh, I will try to argue that indeed uh, license inter interoperability is uh, an open issue. I will try to give a, a bird's eye view on license interoperability considering uh, some national licenses and some standard uh, public licenses. I uh, will mention some best practices and some maybe missed op opportunities and try to conclude. Uh, so uh, if our final goal is to allow people to mix data and reuse them in an expected uh, way, uh, also providing to these uh, reuse uh, some legal certainty, uh, then we should also care about uh, perceived legal interoperability. What I mean is that uh, it's not just a matter of theoretical possibility of mixing data coming from different sources, but we want people, and in particular software developers, uh, hackers, firms, uh, and entrepreneurs, uh, uh, to be sure about legal interoperability without, without asking their lawyers, and ideally without reading too many licenses, because one license would be simple if you are working uh, in the domain of big data, reading all the simple licenses of the world would be more complex than reading one complex license. So the overall uh, entropy that you generate in the system could be high even if the individual licenses are simple. Uh, and uh, ideally, we would also have uh, automatic interoperability. We would like search engine and pieces of software to assist users in understand what uh, they can do with uh, a piece of content. Uh, so, since we don't want people to read too many licenses, is no license at all a good solution, the one uh, proposed by the Commission? Uh, in, in order to, to discuss that, uh, I will just quickly try to give uh, some, some legal background, uh, most likely not needed in, in this room, but uh, uh, as you know, the, the default rule for copyright is all rights uh, reserved, and here I, I mean copyright in a broad sense, including uh, sui generis database right, uh, and, and so on. So, without a clear statement or, or uh, an article in the law or something like that, uh, data are locked by default. You can do nothing, essentially. You can read the, the, the data if they are published online, maybe make a local copy if there is a, a button to download, uh, but uh, not more than, than, than that. So, in order to have open data, if you don't have uh, some clear statements uh, as licenses or in the law, you need also open licenses, and here I use license in a broad way, including dedication, waivers, notices, and so on. Uh, so to avoid uh, prohibitive transaction costs, uh, we have to deal with copyright uh, and with uh, licenses, again, in a broad sense, actually, what the Commission used, uh, uh, like a notice, uh, making reference to official documents of the Commission, and so on. This is just a, a license, in my perception. A very short license uh, pointing to a longer document. Uh, so in my opinion, it's a complex license, but uh, uh, this is uh, just one of the many provocations that I want to include in my presentation. Uh, so to be, to be sure, uh, I think that uh, uh, no license uh, is not an especially good option, because in certain countries it could be, for certain public sector bodies, having somewhere else clear policies about uh, reuse, it may be a good option. So theoretically speaking, I'm sure that the, the legal services of the Commission are right, but uh, we want to have a very high perceived interoperability. And if we really want to go the way of simple things, let's modify copyright law. So be bold, really bold, and do like uh, they did in the US with federal public sector information. Modify uh, a directive, a copyright act. Uh, so uh, be really bold and really simplify. Uh, okay, I, I, I don't expect that you will be able to read uh, this license. This is this is slide. Sorry, this is just uh, mentioning several of uh, possibilities that uh, you have if, if, 
if you want to license uh, uh, public sector information. And apart from the Creative Commons uh, licenses and Open Data Commons licenses, I started mentioning some of the national uh, open government data licenses, uh, attaching to them uh, the most similar uh, Creative Commons attribute, like uh, attribution share, like non-commercial, and, and, and so on, with a, a plus. And the plus uh, typically represent uh, some uh, national uh, worries. In, in these national licenses, typically you have clauses uh, uh, asking you to ensure or to take all reasonable steps to avoid uh, misrepresentation of the data, misleading uh, reuser, uh, avoid uh, presenting yourself as provider of official data, ensure that uh, you will use uh, uh, the information without uh, uh, breaching data protection law and, and so on. Uh, so, given this uh, multiplicity of licenses and taking some of them, uh, we tried within the EVPSI and uh, in part LAPSI project to uh, sketch an interoperability table. Here in the first column you have the, the license, the legal status of the original work, and uh, then uh, you can try to cross that with uh, uh, the possibility of uh, uh, relicensing a derivative work after mixing some other data with uh, one of the licenses in the first uh, row. And uh, uh, so just to focus on a specific part uh, of the table, if you start with uh, a public domain tool, CC0 public domain dedication or license, then you could do whatever you want. If you start uh, with uh, uh, CC by uh, share like, you should again license with CC by uh, share like. All the other possibilities are banned precisely because it's a share like license. And actually, uh, the Italian Open Data License, uh, the Open Government License in the UK are likely compatible with uh, all reuse downstream, uh, including uh, an attribution clause, but uh, likely in, in the sense that. Uh, you need to read uh, both licenses, uh, try to interpret them, or read the frequently asked question on the uh, open government licensing framework. So you, you need some thinking before understanding that there is this uh, kind of uh, compatibility. For sure, we have some uh, universal donors, so to speak. <laughs> the Creative Commons Zero license, uh, the public domain ded dedication or license, any kind of public domain tool. So everything is. Uh, uh, green on the, the line of these tools because they are the best tools to donate your stuff to the, to the world. And do we have, do we have uh, universal uh, receivers like for blood? Uh, well, strictly speaking, no. Uh, in the sense that the only thing which is almost always possible is to mix all the data that you want within your firm without further uh, redistribution. But uh, amongst open licenses, uh, uh, following the open knowledge uh, the, the definition, for instance, uh, Creative Commons attribution to share like is probably the best candidate uh, as uh, the, the universal uh, receiver because it's used uh, by uh, relevant communities like uh, Wikipedia, meaning also Wikipedia and, and, and so on, and because uh, um, several other licenses already started to take this license as a focal point in the this uh, uh, domain, for instance, uh, the GNU free documentation license and the temporary interoperability clause toward uh, Creative Commons attribution share like the first version of Italian Open Data License, which was a share like license, as uh, uh, Ernesto Belisario mentioned, had uh, an explicit interoperability clause toward this license, and by the way, also toward uh, the Open Database license of Open Data Commons. Um, actually, uh, the approaches of uh, the, the various national licenses to word interoperability are uh, various. Uh, typically, there is something in the frequently asked question, for instance, in the uh, open government framework uh, in, in, the, in the UK, you have uh, this uh, frequently asked question saying that uh, the terms of the open government license uh, should not uh, present any barriers in terms of compatibility with uh, Creative Commons licenses. Should not or do not. Here you al already see that uh, there is a, 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 a wording which uh, actually uh, 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 shows that, uh, yes, in principle it should not be a problem, but we don't really know. Uh, uh, 
the, the, the nitty gritty legal details. Uh, and then in, in some other licenses, like the Sans uh, Souvert uh, or the Yod one, you add interoperability clauses within the main text of the license. Uh, and uh, many others use uh, the frequently asked question. Uh, I, I think that in this uh, scenario, the best uh, practice uh, uh, could be represented by the New Zealand government open access and licensing framework. So there, uh, the government pr produces a pretty long uh, document describing uh, all your licensing strategy, why you could take certain uh, uh, choices as a, a public sector body, but, but then, uh, the conclusion is, is that the standard license for copyright purposes that the, the government recommends you as a public sector body to adopt is a Creative Commons attribution license. And they also recommend to use a no known right statement for non copyright, non copyrightable uh, material. Here, you could also use a public domain uh, mark or something like that. Uh, I think another best practice, even if uh, just uh, in a specific sector, is represented by what they did in France with the licence ouverte uh, in terms of uh, addressing the, st the national standard worries that I mentioned before. Uh, here you have a, a section of the open data, uh, a, a section of, of the license describing some relevant facts. These are not clauses of the license, but uh, at the end of, of the license they, they, they say, for, for instance, that. Uh, the reuse of uh, public sector information is subject to compliance with uh, fr France, French privacy uh, and data pro uh, protection uh, le uh, legislation. So this is not a clause of a license. This is uh, mandatory in general for everybody in the system and there is a reminder uh, within the license. Uh, I would say that the very best practice would be a reminder within the licensing framework outside of uh, the license in order not uh, to break license interoperability. Because uh, as uh, uh, Timothy uh, Volmer mentioned, uh, Creative Commons licenses, for instance, which are by far the most widespread uh, copyright licenses, uh, public licenses, uh, do not cover non-copyright aspects. I mean, privacy, publicity, trademarks, cultural heritage, protection law, mentioning this just because we are in Italy and we have strange laws in this domain. Um, so if you want to address this issue within your licensing framework, you could still adopt a Creative Commons license and add some notices, uh, links, uh, moral suasion statements, whatever, uh, concerning these kind of issues, which are not covered by uh, the license uh, itself. Uh, so uh, here, uh, coming to some of my con conclusion, I really think that uh, if you are advising public sector information holder, uh, you have a, an opportunity of uh, drafting a one-page document, including the link to a Creative Commons license and may maybe a copy of the Commons deed, the human readable version of a Creative Commons license, which is indeed a slightly more complex document with respect to any uh, specific national license, but it's one license to solve all the problems, basically, for communities and for government, in particular, if we are talking about a 4.0 license. Um, and, uh, uh, of course, uh, um, in case you, you don't like Creative Commons uh, approach uh, and you really want to go on with a local version of the license, uh, it's important to make sure that it's just uh, an attribution license because, as we said, you have kind of good interoperability. And in this case, please re remember about the reasonable attribution requirement, not a strict formal attribution requirement because uh, you have stacking issues, you have a technical issue, for instance, with linked open data with uh, at attribution. Uh, and uh, I will try to, to quickly conclude because I already uh, passed my 15 minutes. Uh, I, I think that. Uh, we start adding a, a small, admittedly small problem uh, because of the attrition, the reuse mechanism uh, in, uh, in terms of cross-border uh, opportunity because we have member states creating all their national licenses, maybe the parliament creating a different license, 
which is not really different, but uh, it's, uh, it has another name, another uh, URL, so it's different from the point of view of uh, the user. And uh, uh, actually, even if I really join uh, uh, all the people who are praising the UK for the great work that they did in leading by example in this domain and by accident, uh, they started leading by example maybe in the wrong uh, direction because when they decided very early to adopt uh, a public license for their data, Creative Commons licenses were not really able to address some of the needs of a European public sector uh, information holder, and so they decided to go this way of national licenses, which proved to be a great success. Also, in marketing terms, in a political terms, it's very powerful. So, uh, the conclusion uh, is, is that uh, it's a learning process. We already learned several things. Uh, I didn't mention, for instance, for the uh, presentation within Lapsi, the issue of uh, non-commercial clothes creating interoperability problem with communities uh, and, and so on. So I think this part is almost solved. We are already focusing on uh, attribution licenses. We could do more in terms of uh, thinking about these licensing frameworks using standard copyright licenses. And I think that the Commission could draft actually a European licensing framework, which could be customizable even at the level of the single municipality, but uh, at adopting uh, just a few, maybe one, two, of the most standard and widespread uh, copyright licenses like uh, Creative Commons Attribution in its forthcoming 4.0 version, uh, the drafting of which could be supported by the interaction with the uh, public sector body. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Federico, for uh great world tour of different uh, licensing approaches. Um, do we have a, a quick question for Federico before we continue? We have one in the centre of the floor here. I just have a criticism and you know it. Uh, I think if you simplify at the end of, as, as you said, one page license from the public sector body to the public, just to simplify and avoid that open that activist I have too much to, to, to read. It, it's too easy, maybe, but it's just avoiding the problem. And then, if there is, if there are problems in the future, it will be uh, the court that will decide what was not written in the license, uh, how to, to solve the problem. Uh, now I'm, I'm working uh, like, uh, as a legal advisor for the university, so a PSI holder. And we know if we avoid to write too many clauses, then we open the door to all concerns. And if there is a problem, it will be a court that will decide for us what will be done. So I don't think it's a good idea for lawyers. It's just avoiding the problem at the first step. But maybe then if there are problems and we are talking about uh, data from public sector bodies, sensitive data, I don't know if it's a solution. I, I'm, I'm not sure uh, if, if I got the point, because here what I'm actually recommending is to use a very, a relatively complex and detailed legal tool, Creative Commons license, instead of a very short and simple legal tool, like uh, the notice from the Commission of uh, UK uh, Open Government License. So I could be accused of, of, of favoring long U US-like contracts, but not of uh, encouraging people to use oversimplified uh, so, uh, solutions. So my, my question in response to your question would be, what is missing within the Creative Commons 4.0 draft in terms of the clauses that uh, would make happy and safe your uh, university and the legal department of your uh, uh, university? For things which are not related to copyright, for instance, uh, some clear information about privacy, uh, my recommendation is just to uh, say there uh, in, the, in this uh, one page of the licensing framework, in the, the starting of the template of the licensing framework, that uh, this uh, uh, data set, if this is the case, includes some personal data. Uh, and that uh, uh, the use of personal data is subject to data protection law, and that uh, the data have been collected on the basis of this specific norm, 
uh, and publish on the basis of that other specific norm so that uh, for the reuser it's easy to understand what the domain in which the data could be reused. So at the end of the day, I'm recommending to provide more information to a reuser than in the standard uh, national license, which is just saying, please respect privacy law. Yeah. It's like selling knives and saying, please don't kill people. Yeah, of course, but uh, it don't need to, to write that down on the package of a knife, in my opinion. And of course, depending on the national legislation, it could be a good idea to do that, but it should not, in my opinion. Okay, thank you, Federico, for that clarification. I suggest you come and uh, join us at the table. Uh, we, we now have a few minutes remaining, um, a little bit over five minutes, and I thought it might be useful to have a quick summary uh, and perhaps pick out some of the key points. So I'm going to pick off or start off with some of the recurring themes that came across in our presentations this morning. Uh, I think first of all, this movement, this big movement towards open data licensing, uh, and I think a key thread which cuts through these presentations is uh, the inspiration from Creative Commons. So I think people have learned a lot from Creative Commons, uh, they've adapted their approaches, they've, they've uh, taken the inspiration and then modified and adapted to their specific circumstances. So I think very valuable works going on in that area. Uh, also I think of course a big theme for us is reuse and I think the Creative Commons um, remix culture is something that we're increasingly picking up on. So how do you combine data from, from different sources? So reuse, open data, um, a, a lot of different countries going down the sort of data.gov.country type of route. Uh, some very interesting work which is going on in Creative Commons and uh, the version 4.0 that's coming through. I'm very pleased to see the uh, extension of the thinking into the data, PSI, uh, education and science sectors. So I think all very good stuff there. Uh, and then I think uh, our last presentation from Federico gave us a, a very good kind of world perspective. Uh, and I personally picked up on his interoperability table. Uh, it's nice to see the green there, but also I think there's quite a lot of red that we, we have to think about. And this issue of stacking of licenses uh, is vitally important. So I think for me those were the key themes. Uh, I'd like to throw it open to the floor if we have any questions from the floor for our esteemed presenters. Uh, I think I, I should uh, give a, at least uh, a try to reply to a very close uh, concern about simplicity. Uh, the Commission review decision. Uh, Lewis, we're having some difficulties here just with the clarity of the sound, so if you could just pronounce very clearly. Yeah, sorry. Can, we can pick up the. Uh, the Commission reviews decision uh, talks about uh, open uh, licenses and defines them as uh, non-transactional licenses, so unilateral uh, uh, declarations that you can reuse and what you can do. And uh, so the problem is not uh, really about uh, uh, whether it's transactional or non-transactional. It's always a license. You can call it also a notice. But the names uh, don't, don't matter. It's a non-transactional uh, statement. Um, I think it's the same with uh, probably the CC uh, 4.0. Uh, now uh, we know uh, uh, there is a, a, a need for interoperability also in the legal dimension. So licenses should be interoperable. I don't know whether the UK. Uh, government license, uh, which is already there for some years, have ra has raised any problems of interoperability with uh, CC. Uh, I am not aware of any. Uh, we try to do, uh, to go beyond in terms of simplicity. We think simplicity is important because it's true, CC 
uh, there are the, these graphic uh, symbols, they are simple, but then you have to read the old text, and then you have lots of definitions and uh, uh, small uh, print that, uh, uh, at least for uh, European lawyers, are not always uh, self-evident, that they are really uh, absolutely indispensable, uh, and whether they uh, complicate or simplify things, uh, because in the end, of course, uh, courts will always have a role to, to fill the gaps uh, with uh, more or less simple uh, uh, licenses. Now, uh, we are, of course, willing to learn, uh, and if uh, uh, we know of any problem of uh, incompatibility or non-interoperability, we try to do it as interoperable as possible. Uh, but uh, we might be wrong, and we might have to adjust our, our position. Uh, this was just uh, uh, also because of timing pressure. We had to launch the portal in September, and uh, I'm not sure if CC 4.0 was already uh, fine-tuned. Anyhow, uh, this will be launched as, as, as such, and uh, we will see uh, by experience whether something needs to be added or uh, uh, replaced altogether. Uh, for the time being, uh, this was a, a solution that, that was imposed a, a bit uh, uh, for the, by the circumstances. Thanks. Hey Lewis, for a, a long question. <laughs> uh, and I think what it does bring out is this need to interoperate at multiple levels. And I think this is part of the challenge. So I don't know who would like to kick off with a, a, a response there. Um, Federico. A very short response is that uh, actually I agree. The foreword of my presentation was there just to say that this is a detail. Uh, just uh, I, I don't want. I, I, I don't know why uh, we uh, want to risk. Uh, uh, to uh, have problems uh, while we could uh, simply avoid them, but we could wait uh, for the problems to arise. Uh, I, I think that they will not arise. There will be no major problems. There will just be uh, several frequently asked questions to write down, several questions on forums, several people saying, oh, I don't understand what, what's going on. But uh, uh, this will be the problem. Very small level of attrition in the system. We, we have. Uh, worse problems to, to, to tackle. So, okay, we, we could just say, uh, let's address the, the real issue, which is that we don't publish the, the, the data, typically. Uh, but uh, if, if we want to talk about license interoperability, I, I think that, uh, uh, in, in theory, the current situation is not optimal. Thank you, Federico. Any further thoughts from this side of the table? Um, I was just going to, to add that you know, we're, we're very keen on the concept of interoperability. Um, we haven't had any difficulties reported to us as regards the OGL and Creative Commons. Um, and I think it's important that we, we made a sort of statement of intent by saying that you know, we actually welcome people using and mixing data sets under those two different licensing regimes. Thank you very much, John. A very big thank you to our speakers for their presentations. So I think a, a big round of applause of thanks. Uh, I very much appreciated the, the presentations and I have one final thought from my quotes here. So, uh, whoever said nothing is impossible never tried slamming a revolving door. So thank you very much for that. <laughs>